Uh, I'm Jeremy, not Bruce, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about our experience teaching a, a cryptography class that incorporates Maple in an intensive way. Um, I've taught this class for many years, um, but not recently, and so some of my Maple idioms might be a little dated. Um, this last term, uh, Bruce took over the course and you'll see I have lots of Maple worksheets, which I'm going to give you a flavor of how they're used to support the course. And he added a, a new tool called Mobius. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Mobius, um, but I'll give a little demo of that and see how we can, our goal is to merge the two things together effect, effectively. So let me tell you a little bit about the class. Um, I have kind of a blank Maple worksheet here just to remind me what I'm talking about, and then I'm going to pull up a whole bunch of other ones. Anyway, this is taken primarily by computer science students. Um, I'll show you the prerequisites in a second. They've had calculus, discrete math, linear algebra, and at least one course that introduces them to proof. Um, there are math students taking it, and I find the people that, that do the best in it are those that are either a CS student with a math minor or vice versa. Um, anyway, so one of the goals is to get the students that are computer science students to care about the math that they've had courses for, but they've forgotten a lot about the material. Um, this is taken at the junior level, and um, in, in our program at Drexel, students choose for their upper level courses tracks, and one of them is this security track, and, and cryptography can count towards that track. Okay, I'm only going to open up one of these things here. I'll, I'll flash at you the topics, just so you get a flavor of what we cover. Um, oh, and I'll make a plug here. So we do have a textbook that I build on and incorporate the worksheets for, and, and I recommend it. It's, it's um, Introduction to Mathematical Cryptography, and it's the second edition, and I like the book a lot. Um, anyway, so here's just a quick flash of the topics. So I always do start out with an... Yeah, let's do it. Uh, let's do it. Is that a, a better? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just close. You're far away. So, Anyway, so I always start out with an introduction to Maple. Obviously, the students have had programming courses through data structures, but there are idiosyncrasies of Maple that, that it pays to spend a week going over rather than looking at lots of issues. Um, and then we talk about um, underlying <laughs> number theory algorithms, Euclidean algorithm, modular arithmetic, and so on. And then we go into public key crypto systems. Um, RSA, Elgamal, and, and so on. And, and um, then later on, we do do, um, we talk about discrete logarithms, and we do Elgamal, not totally Elgamal already, and, and we do that with also with elliptic curves. And, and so you'll see one of the niceties of Maple is you can implement what's discussed in the book for elliptic curves very easily, and they can start playing with it and, and getting appreciation for it. And this last time I taught it, I, I did the, the lattice cryptography, again, which really benefits from a lot of the things that are already in, in Maple for, for dealing with that, like the LLL algorithm and so on. Um, anyway, at Drexel, unfortunately, we only have 10 weeks, so I can't cover all these topics. I, I did get through the lattice cryptography, but if you had an extra week, uh, there are other topics if you had another full semester rather than 10-week quarter. Um, anyway, more important than the particular topics are the course objectives. And let's flash that open a second. And I can make that a little bit bigger too. For me. There we go. All right, so some of them you might expect. You're teaching a course on cryptography and the algorithmic number theory that goes along with it, and they should be able to understand and, and utilize theorems from that and, and so on. Um, all of the cryptographic protocols that we talk about, they implement, they also try and break. We talk about attacks and so on, and so they obviously should get comfortable with that. And, and so those first four, one, two, three, four, are what you'd expect that go along with the topic of the course. But it's really the last two that I think are more important for our students. So one, cryptography is a motivation for them to learn some of the math, and the motivation goes a long way. Um, so given that, um, I hope to teach them how to deal with the math in two ways. One is to communicate. So that's both to be able to read something. And reading, it means as you're reading along, experimenting and so on, and getting comfortable and checking things. 
Uh, we did that for all the stuff, and as good as the book is, there are mistakes in it, which you find by going through and computing all the examples. Um, but also they should be able to communicate the other direction. They should be able to discuss math, and they should be able to write. And that's another benefit of the Maple Worksheet, is that it combines writing, the mathematical notation, the computation, all in one thing, and that's part of what they should be able to do. And they should be able to read, I already mentioned before, and so like when we cover RSA, the, the R, original RSA paper is a beautiful paper, and, and I have them read it, and go ahead and you'll see, do some computations associated with the paper, and they do that multiple times. Okay, and then before that is this exploration. So math, Maple is a wonderful tool for exploring things. So I give you a theorem, and again, these are well-known elementary theorems, but when you're first introduced to them, they're not. And how do you know? What does the theorem mean? Well, I want you to compute examples, try things out, convince yourself that it might be true before you worry about a proof or anything like that. And generally, if you're exploring things, do experiments. If we're looking at an algorithm and you want to know its performance, time it, measure it, compare it to other functions. So that spirit is really the main part of the class. Okay, one more about logistics, and then I'll give you some demos so you can see what, what we actually do to hopefully achieve those objectives. All right, so logistics. Um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, here I'm lecturing up here, but I realized lecturing is not the way to teach stuff. And so I never teach any course where there's not an active component of the classroom. They have to come there to do something to make it worthwhile for them to come, not just listen to me. And so um, there are weekly either quizzes or labs. Most of them are labs, and they do them with a partner. I always like to have more than one person do it so they can discuss. And then I have a chance to go around and talk to the individual groups when they have questions. And so that in-class activity is almost half of their grade. Um, and it's not that they penalize if they make mistakes, but they have to participate and actively be engaged. And they should come to class prepared, and I'll say how Mobius supports that in a second. And then the rest are our homework assignments, and they're all given as Maple worksheets, and they have things to do, either computations, algorithms to implement to study, um, theorems to try out and test, um, and then sometimes they have to prove things which they have to, to write in, in, in the Maple worksheet. Okay, so that's the overview. Yes, Mike? Maybe you could come back to it, but you've got a very large portion of the grade for homework assignments. Um, it's going to be cheating. Yeah, that's uh, it's a problem. I, it, in this class, it's not been a major issue. Um, I do get to know the students well. From I talk to them and I ask them things about it. And so I, I rather than you know we have a code of honor, and if uh, oops, where's my mouse? Um, they know that they have to discuss things with me, and they don't know when that might happen. So it's not perfect, but um, I get a pretty good flavor for what they know and what they don't know. Anyway, we, that's a whole topic. Okay, so uh, let me begin by diving right in. So we're going to start with RSA, and I'm just going to pull up Mobius and show you what we can do with it. So, so um, in that little maple worksheet is the link to the course. Everything I'm talking about is available um, through the course web page. Um, anyway, let's switch over here. So this is Mobius. I'm going to log into it. And I just got introduced to this. As I said, Bruce worked over the last quarter to incorporate it. Uh, let me pick this and we can look at some of the problems. All right, so I'm going to start out with an RSA demo. And, and here we go. Okay, so these are accessible through the web and there's some description. I know this now we couldn't really can't read this. And so what he did is I had some slides, and the slides would discuss the math. And what I would do in class is we would do examples together, and then I would have them work on little things. And I would sketch a proof, and they would try and fill in some details, and I'd go around the class. The class size is about 30, so I had a chance to interact. I remember people working in groups. And so what Bruce did was try and take my slides and make them interactive. So in Mobius, we can combine uh, problem generation, um, calculation and checking. And so embedded in what was my slide before is now a description. And here the steps of the, the algorithm are outlined. And then um, you can go through and 
do an example. And since you can't read that, I'll just blaze it up here. So there are little buttons you can press. So I can generate a key. And I can show what actually happens. And this shows the calculation of the key, how it was the steps that were outlined in that previous description. And then you can go ahead and encrypt and decrypt. And so this is just forces you to do something. Um, you're reading along, you can do an example, now in a constrained environment, not like the worksheets there. And then after that, he asks questions about it. And in this stage, this is before they introduce it. So think of this as like a pre-class thing. So if we're going to talk about some of the details here, I can have them do this ahead of time. They can go through an example and at least read the parts. They might not understand everything. So they're talking about maybe they don't know what the Euler fee function is, the Totian functions. That's OK. They can at least see the steps and then relate what happened in this example. And you see, I'll just show you one example of what he asked here. All right. Again, I'm just going to read to you because I know you can't read it there. OK, so it talks about the steps of that example that I just calculated. And it says, all right, RSA encryption requires some quantities, integer quantities. Explain how each one of them was determined, which is outlined in the description before. So it's nothing, thing, but you have to go through it. So like a little sanity check. And this is graded on the spot. And if you make a mistake, let's say I, I make a mistake here. And I check how did I do. And oh, I got it wrong, but you click over here and it describes what you got wrong. All right. And so anyway, so this they do ahead of time. And so a lot of things that I had in the reading before, which they wouldn't do, we can now have some control over whether it's done. And I can take, remember, I'm using the lab time in the class to do activities. And so if they come in prepared, it, it makes it that much it's better. So this is the, the main thing that um, I benefit from Mobius, is that we can have what my description was and activities that they can do and check before they come to class. OK, so that's the first thing I wanted to show you. And now let's go back to some worksheets. So I'm just going to go through three or four, not in detail, just to give you a flavor of the activities that I like them to do in class. And let me make the font bigger. OK. So this is the very first lab. And so a lot of it is to introduce Maple. And so the Maple data structures we need, lists, tables, how you write Maple functions, and so on. And this is, I, I actually begin with a simple substitution cipher on um, things they've heard of before. And this nicely motivates uh, modular arithmetic. All right? So this is just the shift cipher. And not that, and here, so what does the lab say? I'll just give you a flavor here. So this is, this lab is intended to familiarize students with Maple and Maple programming language, review encryption, decryption, and cryptanalysis of shift cipher, and more general substitution ciphers. Students should read through the commands, run the commands, the Maple code, and embed it in their little questions that they, that they need to fill out. Um, I also, as I mentioned before, promote group activity. And the labs are designed to complete in time, so we had actually an hour and 20 minutes to do it. So it gives them enough time. But if they didn't finish, they, they can um, continue afterwards. And we have discussion boards where they can ask questions about it. Um, anyway, the only thing I wanted to show you here, so this is a nice just review of the basic Maple data structures and so on. And I go ahead and implement the, uh, uh, the uh, shift cipher. And what do I ask them to do? So these are the kind of things. The very simple startup. Perform a brute force attack on the <laughs> cipher. I, they just write a loop and they try out all of the different shifts until they find one that, that decrypts it. So again, it's promoting that experimentation. And when they're motivated to, to decrypt and so on, this is trivial. Um, it, it helps. They, they have a motivation for doing the calculations they want. Um, the second question is, all right, do a frequency analysis. And here we benefit from the great li libraries that are in Maple. There's a function on um, character frequencies. They go ahead and they can see two or like maybe one or two likely candidates for the shift and try it out. Um, yes, sir. Sorry to ask first. So again, do you write the code and then do you have them execute the code and then see the code, or do you have them actually design the code? 
So we, we shift. So I start out with, I write, this is the very first lab. So I write the code for the first lab, and then they start making changes to it. And then later on, they'll do more of it on their own. So it's a gradual process as we, as we go through. Okay, and the second part of the lab is the substitution ciphers, where um, we use things like um, it's um, brute force no longer works. And so they explore, and they can use Maple to compute limits and see how quickly and factorial grows and things like, like this. Um, and then that forces them, yes, Michael? How, how much computing background do they have to have? How many programming courses do they have? Okay, so, so yeah, we started with the, the prerequisites. They've made it at least through data structures. Um, this is a third year course, uh, but they have mandatory data structures. So when I talk about lists and tables and so on, they've seen it before, they just haven't seen it in Maple. All right, so that's the first one. Let's. Uh, jump ahead to see how we can evolve a little bit. So in the second lab, we're, we're now building up and starting to study modular arithmetic, and we go from a shift cipher to an affine cipher, and I let them figure out how to break it, and they have to implement the affine. So it's a minor change, going back to your question, it's a minor change from what we did before. And then they, they um, have to figure out, well, we had, I tell them about modular inverses, how you do modular arithmetic in Maple, and it's not that hard, but they have to figure out how to, to crack it. And I think I always like to give them little fun things when they crack the, the codes. Let's see what I, what I said here. Oh, no, this might. Oh, don't, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan, so it's once upon a time you dressed so fine. You threw the bums a dime in your prime. Anyway, yeah. That's. Number one Rolling Stone song. <laughs> okay, whoops, what did I do? Oh, yeah, there you go. That's even worse there. I, I'm <laughs> exposing all my secrets. So. All right, um, all right, the third lab we get to RSA. And if you go back and here's the course web page, and you click in to the lectures. Um, all right, here's RSA. And as I mentioned before, so one of the goals, and this is the RSA paper which they can download from our library. And if you look at the lab, the first part of the lab is to go through, and in the paper, they do a small example at the end. And they go ahead and they, they calculate that example in, in Maple. And so uh, we won't look at it. So the first question this lab goes through all of the supporting modular arithmetic and the theorems they need, like Fermat's little theorem and so on. And for each of those theorems, they try out some examples and look for patterns and report back what they saw. Right? And then at the end of it, um, in this case, I still give them a RSA code. Um, they do the small example by hand, so they implement all the steps. And then I give them code, and we end with, all right, this is the encrypted meshes, figure out what I said. All right. And so this is just an exercise in calling the Maple I factor routine. But you can experiment with different lengths. So what was my, oh, there's N right there. So, so I said, um, anyway, that, that factors relatively quickly. Um, yeah, let's just see how quickly, I don't know. Yeah, see. And they can experiment with it. They can make the key larger and, and, and see. OK, so that's kind of the build up. Um, we doing? All right, let's do something a little bit more complicated, and then maybe we can have some discussion. All right, let me show you um, an assignment. So those are the labs. There's things that are intended to be doable if you come prepared in an hour and a half, hour, 20 minutes. Assignments kind of look the same. So this is a, the second assignment. The first assignment was implementing, we saw substitution ciphers. They implemented the Vigenaire uh, poly substitution cipher. And this lab is doing some stuff with RSA. But um, another 
easily breakable is the Hill cipher, which is just a matrix. So you, it's a block cipher, so you go into blocks. And I like this because, as I said, students have taken linear algebra, but a lot of them didn't incorporate it into their being in any real sense. And so this is really nice to exercise that. So we do attacks and we get to look. And so there's a, the last two attacks on this. So they're given a black box and they can plug in a, a block and get the output. And so there they have to recover the <laughs> matrix for the Hill cipher. And of course, if they plug in a basis, they can recover the matrix. And the other one is uh, where they're intercepting messages. And they have to get enough messages so that you have a linearly independent thing that you can, can solve. Anyway, that changes their perspective on, on basic linear algebra that, where they're actually trying to break this thing. And, and so I find that that helps a lot when they're trying to remember stuff. So rather than just review and say, all right, here's some matrix equation, give them something where they have to compute it. And then they can ask. They can ask questions. So I'm not trying to trick them. OK, that gives you a flavor. And that begins to build up. So let's take a look. Um, what I said, well, it's really nice about Maple is we can do fairly sophisticated things. We're not trying to do fast implementations, but we're just trying to be able to experiment and understand. So this is a elliptic curve-based crypto. And um, all right, so I talk about the arithmetic with elliptic curves. And what's nice, again, is you can illustrate by examples. I'll make the font bigger. All right, so remember how that works. So there's an elliptic curve. You have two points on the curve, and you get a, a third point. You draw the line between the two points, and then you reflect about the horizontal axis. And so um, I go through the calculation. To get, and where's the picture? There you go. All right, so you see there's the line, and then you reflect. And so once we go through the step and we do an example, then we generalize it. And we uh, write some code. Yeah. And it goes through the steps. So, so there's the function. And this function I, I give them, so this does arithmetic on the elliptic curve. Um, and now that we have it, so one of the hardest things to show that arithmetic makes sense is that it's associative. Uh, but now we have an algorithm that implements it, and we're doing things symbolically, so we can let Maple prove it for us. And so if we go to the assignment that goes with this, I'm not, there we go. I, all right. So this is the kind of fun things you can do real quickly. So I give them the code that we just went over, and there to uh, prove it's associative. So we have three points, P, Q, and R, um, given symbolically x1, y1, x2, y2, x1, or x3, y3. What's that? Yeah, I have to keep doing that, and I forget. It would OK. Let me make it a little bit bigger. OK. All right, so there's the elliptic curve E and three points. And now I call my function to add two and the third, and I do it in the two different ways. And I want to check that they're equal, so see it's fairly messy. And so what do we do? We, we uh, compute it the two different ways. And I subtract, and I should get zero. And uh, sure enough, I do. And here, you can use the maple simplify, but you have to give the side relations that they're on, the points are on the curve. And there you go. So that's something they can do real quickly. Now, if you look at the code, there are some special cases for points at infinity and so on. And so they actually have to check all the different cases. Um, anyway, so this is building up. And this is towards maybe the week seven or week eight. And, and they're doing stuff like this. And since we can compute, they can do all sorts of experiments. And so in this case, um, they look at elliptic curves now over a, a finite field over integers mod p for different primes. And they can plot things, and they can look at the points, and they can count points. So there's some theorems that tell us how many points we'd expect to get. And they can study that. We've done lots with square roots already earlier in the course for, uh, for um, 
coin flipping and so on protocols, and so they can use that to make the counting a little bit faster. Um, and then they go ahead and they implement discrete log for elliptic curve arithmetic and use that to implement the Elgamal public key crypto system. So this is all easily doable when you have all the support for, for this. All right, I got one last thing to do and then I'll open it up for questions. So this is the last assignment and you know, I'll read parts of it. Okay, so I remember 10 week quarters they zip Zip by, um, we're week 10. I got one lecture on Lattice Crypto, which is nowhere near enough, except if I succeeded with the two objectives at the end of my list of course objectives. Um, the book has a wonderful description. They have examples. And so what I ask them to do, this is in lieu of doing a final. Think of it as like a little, did you achieve what I want you to? So here, this assignment explores lattice space cryptography, which is covered in chapter seven, blah, blah, blah. And um, they are a couple of sections. Seven, eight gives a, an example of the crypto system I want them to study. And the other section, 713, is how to break it with LLL in, in certain cases. And they are to go ahead and replicate the examples, so something we've been doing all throughout the quarter. They, they read the chapters, they experiment to understand, they implement and replicate the examples, and then they generalize to some code. And they give me some description, what's going on in the algorithm, so, and they submit that as their worksheet. And if I've succeeded, even though I only had one lecture on this, they're able to do it. And um, I won't say everyone did, but I typically have 30 students, and probably at least two-thirds are able to do this. And you see, this is from before I was taking them step by step, and towards the end, you give them description and the skills that I've been trying to emphasize throughout the term, they should be able to apply. All right, whether that's true or not, um, I have it through, you know, I've been doing this for about 10 years, and I keep track, but I certainly haven't done studies on what the right way. But I, I certainly get positive feedback, and I see them go from not remembering any of the math to, to wanting to do it. Okay, I will end there. All right, questions? Yes, sir. So in teaching them April, or have they come to your office hours and you talk to them, what are the sort of number one problem, number a couple problems that they most likely are to have, and what have you done to address them? All right, so there's two things. There's one little goofy thing with the worksheet format is they're not used to having variables that can be symbols. And so they're used to being assigning values to it. And so assigning a symbol or an equation to a variable takes a little while to get used to. And when things also the order evaluation is a killer. So, so like I tell them to always do a restart here and incorporate code. So lots of times they don't oh, yeah. get things and then they get an error message they don't understand because something wasn't evaluated or it was if I didn't clear it out. So we, we developed some protocols so that they don't run into those kind of errors. But they have to do it at least once to appreciate it. So early on I let them do that. The other thing is more of a coding style. So they come in, they learn Python, our intro classes in Python. Um, and then they have uh, Java, they used to be C++. So they've had a couple of languages. They're not used to, you know, when you have a first programming language, it's kind of in the small. So they're not used to using things at a higher level of abstraction. So rather than writing a loop, you do a vector operation. Rather than, you know, so bringing that up takes some forcing them to get out of that mode. And so there's like, in Maple, you can do a kind of functional programming. They're not used to that. And so there's lots of loops and so on. Um, and so they tend to initially write maple code that's way longer than it needs to be and doesn't illustrate the math in an effective way, and that takes some training. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I can. Um, Jeremy, how many hours a week are they doing? You say, is it just the one, two? No, no, we, we meet twice a week for an hour and a half each, each time. Um, lots of it goes on outside, so if they don't finish, I let them, for the labs, you know, work outside. And when they do the assignments, a lot of it is asking questions. And so I've now become a Slack fan, and so that's what I use for discussion. 
and um, not this class, but the last class I taught, which is on uh, data science at scale for whatever it's worth. But we had um, like 10,000 messages in our Slack channel for the, for the term. So there is lots of engagement um, outside of class, too, which, which is important. So I haven't taught it. The last time I taught it was 2017, and, and now our, our freshman class now is about 300. And I would say when I taught it, I was getting like 35 students, 30 to 35 students. Uh, but that was before these big waves made it to the upper level. So I'd be curious to see what happens next term. They're just about to register in a week, and we'll find out. But the, there is enough upper level choice. We don't mandate it. And so students do take things they want to take. Um, yeah. All right, anything else? All right, thank you very much, and thank you for. <laughs>